Good evening. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and present my work. So I come, or actually my journey, in the realm of digital humanities and social computing started in 2013. During that time, it was 2000, at, during, during that time, the Syrian crisis had already unfolded in 2011. And by the end of 2012, almost 140,000 Syrians sought refuge in Jordan as they were desperately seeking for a safe place. At that time, I was a recent graduate working in an IT company as a software quality analyst. The Syrian crisis escalated, which led to the establishment of two large refugee, com uh, refugee camps in Jordan named Zatari and Ezra camp. Witnessing the plight of those vulnerable people, there was a strong desire that ignited inside of me that I need to volunteer and provide support for those people. And my chance to make a difference started when I joined an American organization, humanitarian organization, called International Rescue Committee, where I served as a data analyst. I worked on a project called Child Protection, and the aim of the project was to reunite separated and accompanied children with their parents and their caregivers. Those children lost their parents during their journey from Syria to Jordan. And when they arrived to Jordan, they needed all type of services, education, safety, psychosocial support. I've done, or actually my work was pivotal in terms of managing all of the data and technology that was needed to achieve this outcome. Similar to any professional endeavor, this journey was full of good milestones as well as challenges. And since I'm a person who works in technology, I would like to share with you some of those challenges. In that project, we all relied on a central system called Child Protection Information Management System. Unfortunately, that system was not following a human-centric approach, meaning the functionalities and features within, those, within that system were not serving the needs of the social workers and humanitarian aid workers. This means that they weren't able to do a crucial part of their job. Second thing, the security concerns were paramount. There were the system experience, a lot of data breaches that led to the loss of vital documents and confidential data. The third issue, which was, which was a major issue that affected also the children, the lack of interoperability. Now in the UN world and in the humanitarian world, the humanitarian organization worked together in order to deliver a comprehensive service to vulnerable people, refugees, internally displaced people, underserved people. This system was separating in an isolation. It wasn't connected to any of the governmental agency systems as well as other UN system. This stopped the delivery of essential humanitarian services to those children. So throughout what I've just mentioned, I think many ideas start popping up about it didn't lead to any advantage to, those, to, enhance, to enhance those children's situation. Now I'll move also to another story, to another project actually, and that project was fostering to build a global and inclusive environment for people with disability at a national level and an international level. It was implemented in my country, Jordan. So together with my team, our first job was to do an initial assessment of the data prevalence about people with disability, their inclusivity in the services that are provided, and how well people are doing, people with disability particularly. We reached out to an astonishing fact that there is a massive shortcoming of data prevalence about the identification of people with disability in terms of their demographical information, the education level, healthcare services, and also some of the legislative information. So we needed like a kind of an urgent and immediate action. 
First thing what we've done is that we embarked on a series of awareness campaigns to get the attention of governmental agencies as well as humanitarian agencies on the importance to rectify this issue. Second thing, which was also a very interesting part, that the gap of the prevalence of data was based on a stereotype that people with disability were scared to come and show up and ask for support and ask for services because they were marginalized in a way or another. So what we've done is we tried to combat this discriminatory practices. The, let me say the huge successful milestone was when we were able to establish a unified platform in which governmental entities, public and private sector were able to access it, customize it. So at the end of the day, people with, with disability were able to access an array of vital services, education, health care, legislative and so on. And there was a purpose of doing it, a kind of a centralized hub that is accessed by many parties, essential parties, such as the governmental, private and public sector, because we were advocating for a collaboration of effort between those parties to continue creating a proactive and welcoming environment for people with disability. So as I reach to the end of the two, the two stories, a very important question I think will start popping up into our minds. What are we supposed to do in our roles in order to reduce the digital divide? There are plenty of solutions and I would be happy to listen to some of your recommendations. But I'll start by suggesting the first solution, which is digital literacy. It's very important that governmental agencies as well as, edu as, well as education, educational agency to invest more in digital literacy. And we shouldn't wait until pupils are in the university. It should start at the school level. So it should be indulged with, within the traditional educational curriculum and within the extracurricular activities. For instance, AI, AI activities, robotic classes, and so on and so forth. Second thing, which is a kind of a new idea, and I think it's being implemented in Finland. So the establishment of digital educational organization. This kind of a public entity can be accessed by any person from any background, regardless of the educational level, digital literacy. That person can access and use the available digital devices and ask for guidance and help, and even improve their skills in technology. Accessibility. Now I think most of the people here and all over the world, they own smartphones. But believe me, some people, they don't even have a Nokia small phone. So the accessibility, first we need to increase the connectivity and make sure that every individual is connected to the internet. This will help unconnected people to get connected, therefore they will be exposed to better economical and learning opportunities. Second thing, the establishment of equitable broadband access as well as building of a robust network infrastructure. Of course, government cannot do it by itself. This needs a partnership of efforts between public parties, tech firms and governmental entities. A kind of motivating factors for public and private uh, sectors to promote or actually help in this digital uh, gap is to provide tax incentives for internet service provider as well as tax as well as tech firms in or the, those who are actually investing in bridging the digital divide. Third thing, third solution. Affordability. So as I just mentioned, some people, they don't have even the money to buy a small phone, not even a smartphone. So government and in, uh, governments and international non-governmental agencies should support by providing grants or subsidies to low-income households so they'll be able to purchase uh, affordable computers, smartphones, laptops. 
Also, we need to work on the promotion of the usage of recycled or reused electronic devices. Moreover, government should collaborate with internet service providers in order to offer discounted internet plans, especially for disadvantaged people. Last but not least, more partnership should be done with local tech businesses to ensure or to establish kind of an open zone of free Wi-Fi, especially in fragile areas. Uh, so based on that, I think we can come up to one conclusion, which is reducing the digital divide is not simple as handling a mobile or a laptop to a person and leave that person. It's more about a collaborative effort between public sector, private sector, governmental agencies to improve the digital literacy of individuals, build for them robust network infrastructure, and also help them how to use those digital devices and make more awareness how to make good use of this information. Now, as I come from the Middle East, Jordan particularly, where that there's a huge gap in terms of the technology, network, internet, I would like to highlight that some of the areas in the Middle East, particularly Gaza, one week, three, four days ago, was living for 24, 48 hours without any internet access under high level of bombardment and violation of human rights. Linking it to the digital divide, digital divide is also considered a kind of a human right violation. So by combating digital divide, we'll be able also to attain more human rights and to seek for social justice. Thank you very much.